In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. If we were in Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain today, we would all have been waken up by about an hour of millions of bells ringing. The whole city rings its bells, even today in this disastrous state of the church. The bells ring all throughout Santiago de Compostela. And even today, there are thousands of pilgrims who will come, some just for the walk, some for exercise, some for the honor of St. James, most, and all of them seeking something from God, from St. James. And they will line up in long lines to pass up behind the altar, which will end their pilgrimage today. And some would have started from the northern parts of France, some would come from even Eastern Europe, some most come from some parts of Spain or southern France. And all these old trails which were traveled by thousands, by thousands of pilgrims every year for 2,000 years since the martyrdom of the great St. James the Apostle. And today they line up and they will go, go behind the altar, they will embrace the big statue of St. James which holds the relics, his bones. And um, when, I, when I went a number of years ago, actually it was 2012, the hot summer when the Society of Pius X officially chose to go the path of modernist Rome in the actual documents. It's that year, that summer, that hot summer that I made the pilgrimage with another priest. And we had the, the happiness to even say Mass on the very tomb of St. James the Apostle. So this great St. James, he was dubbed by Christ himself, along with his brother St. John, Sons of Thunder. Why? Because they were the ones that walked up to our Lord after he came out of a city that refused to hear him. And they said, Lord, send down fire and brimstone like you did on Sodom and Gomorrah. Destroy that city. They, they just mocked you and drove you out of town. And Christ says to St. James and St. John, You don't know what spirit you are. For the Son of Man came to save what was lost, and not to condemn, not condemn yet. He will condemn at the, uh, at the judgments of each man, at their particular judgment, and of course at the general judgment. So Christ showed his great mercy. And all throughout the Gospels we see St. James and St. John are always with our Lord. They see his miracles. They walk through all the cities. They're on the boat with him when they see him walk on the waters. They see the majesty of our Lord stand up in the huge storm when our Lord stood up in the boat and raised his arms and calmed the sea at a word. At a word. The, the huge storm, the waves that were threatening to flip the boat at one word of Christ the King, there was the, the lake became like glass. And even those who were in the boat, who were not apostles, wondered and stood in awe. Who is this? St. James and John were chosen by our Lord. They were fishermen. They were rough men. They had calluses on their hands, but they were Jews also. So being Jews, they would know the scriptures very well. They would have chanted the Psalms by heart. Their mind would have been rooted in the Scriptures. The whole world was the Scriptures. And the, the longing to see the Messiah someday. And they would have certainly been followers of St. John the Baptist. And they were there when St. John the Baptist pointed him out. Echagus day. There he is. That's the Lamb of God. That's the one foretold by all the prophets. And maybe they were there, perhaps they were there when Christ was baptized by St. John the Baptist and the voice of the Father thundered, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. And the appearance of the Holy Ghost above the head of our Lord and our Lord standing in the river. So you have the manifestation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost who sent the Son into the world. 
And St. James and John, as you know, after living with our Lord three years, they would have been overwhelmed by the night of Holy Thursday, when they were made priests, when they saw the first sacrifice of the Mass, and when they would see our Lord betrayed by Judas, and uh, they would go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it was James, St. James, and St. John, and St. Peter, who were chosen to come a little farther into the Garden of Gethsemane. And they were the ones that our Lord asked to watch and pray as our Lord went to pray to the Father. And then he would be crushed, overwhelmed with sorrow, so that blood would flow from his whole body throughout his skin, pouring rivers of blood in the agony of the garden. And it's to St. James and St. Peter and John that our Lord came back to, and they were asleep. And he appealed to them and said, Would you not watch one hour with me? And they saw our Lord completely transformed and overwhelmed with sorrow, and they never really saw this before. Our Lord changed, overwhelmed, and even fearful because of the human nature that suffered the fear and the sorrow at the sight of the sins of the human race and the vengeance of God's justice. And our Lord would be the lightning rod to take the thunder and lightning of God's justice. And so twice our Lord will go back to pray and he will bleed more, the sweating of blood. So St. James and John were prepared, of course, for this. By several months before, they saw our Lord transfigured in his glory on Mount Tabor. They would have seen Moses and Elias appear with him, talking with him, and these, these, these massive events that were so far above these apostles. But our Lord chose them, and they would, of course, St. James and John would be among the ones to flee at the agony of the garden, and they would follow the passion of our Lord at a distance. They would betray our Lord, they lost the faith, and then our Lord would appear to them at the resurrection three days later. And they would touch his wounds, they would adore him. The same Jesus Christ the King that dwells here in the tabernacle, the same Jesus Christ the King who you, we will have the happiness to receive very soon in this Mass in Holy Communion. So touch our Lord's wounds. As St. Augustine was heard from the mouth of our Lord, when you receive communion, it's not you who hold me, I, the Good Shepherd, hold you. The Good Shepherd who carries us on his shoulders. So great St. James, he would be martyred by the King of Jerusalem, and his body would be sent out to sea, to be forgotten. And the angels would guide the boat carrying his coffin all the way up to northern Spain, along the coast. And up on the shores of Spain, who knows, maybe two fishermen were out fishing or swimming, and they saw this boat with a coffin coming to shore. And they dragged it to shore, and the coffin said, Hik Yachet, whatever the language was, here lies the St. James, the Apostle of the Lord. They, they, they called the bishop of the city, the bishop came, and they took the bones of St. James and honorably, honorably buried him in what is now Santiago de Compostela. Why Spain? Because St. James, as an apostle, after the Pentecost, St. James, by the command of St. Peter, St. Peter was the one who sent the jurisdiction of all the apostles throughout the world. And Thomas, you'll go to South America and India. Matthew, you'll go here. And James, you'll go here. And St. James the Greater was sent to Spain. So he went to Spain. <clears throat> now remember, this is after our Lord's ascension. This is still during the time when the Virgin Mary was still on earth. And St. James was, excuse me, St. John, the brother of St. James, he was with the Blessed Virgin Mary in Ephesus, which is today modern-day Turkey. 
So Our Lady's still alive. She's going to Mass every day with St. John in Turkey. St. James, the Apostle, is far out in Spain, and he's trying to preach to these people. He's trying to give them the faith. He's trying to <clears throat> exhort them to baptism. But they're so stubborn, <clears throat> and they're so rooted in their paganism, they won't hear it. And St. James, he's a hot-headed man, so maybe he was tempted, as he was before, our Lord sent thunder and lightning on these people. But he remembered our Lord's kindness and mercy <clears throat> and perseverance. So he was giving up. He was about to just pack it up and go back to Jerusalem and get a new place to go from St. Peter. But it's then that the Virgin Mary appeared to St. James and she told St. James, don't be discouraged. So, so this is the, Our Lady still on earth in Turkey. She bilocated uh, to Spain and she appeared on a pillar which is today in Saragossa and venerated today and it gives a sweet odor, I understand. I never had the privilege to see this place. But Our Lady appeared on this pillar to St. James and told him, James, my son, don't be discouraged. Keep laboring among these people because someday this country will yield a great harvest for my son. So St. James stayed and he continued to labor and preach. And the grace finally penetrated these rock hearts. And the first flock became baptized and the, the faith became rooted, thanks to the encouragement of the Blessed Virgin Mary, while still on earth. So this great Saint James, we have the ha happiness to honor him today, and his co-brother and co-feast, Saint Christopher, who came and was martyred uh, about 250 years later, the great Saint Christopher. But we won't talk about him, although his story is fascinating the great St. Christopher, who was attacked by the modernists, Pope Paul VI, tore him out of the calendar and called him legend and all, all these modernists, they, they attack every aspect of our Catholic faith. And one of the favorite things they love to do is fabulize and mythologize our Lord himself, the saints, and all the martyrs. They're absolutely miserable, these modernists. They are destroyers of our Catholic faith and they govern now in modernist Rome. And nothing has changed. Nothing has changed since the time of Archbishop of Fad. So if you would endure a little bit with my uh, pati with patience with some of these words I'm going to read to you. But these are great words to hear for us. Because these are the words of Archbishop of Fad right before it's this sermon in 1987 and don't be rolling your eyes and saying, oh, well, that's 1987, this is 2017, that's 15 years ago. What does this have to do with us? It's exactly the same fight. It's exact, nothing has changed from the day our Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, here in this sermon, of uh, what ordinations to the priesthood on June 29th, 1987, in a cone, Switzerland. Nothing has changed. It is still exactly the same as this sermon when he announced, I'm going to go ahead and consecrate four bishops. If only these four bishops today were still in the line of the fight and leading the charge as Archbishop Lefebvre did. But now we're, these four bishops have all collapsed, either by silence or by actual compromise, and it's really tragic. And this is what draws us here today at this beautiful grounds here in England. This is what draws us together, these few families and these few folks, because we want to stay Catholic. We want to hold the torch high. We want to reignite your beautiful England back to the Catholic faith and the whole world back to the Catholic faith. And we pray for the Pope for his conversion to tradition. We pray that the Pope will come back and consecrate Russia, as Our Lady asked. So nothing has changed since, since, since 1987. And remember, England suffered 300 years under the horrible, bloody persecutions 
300 years. We're only 50 years now in this fight. So 50 years, what's that? We've got to be set for the long haul. We've got to be ready to fight till the day we die. And you children got to pick up that fight till the day you die. And your children and your grandchildren, it's, it's, it's been 300 years for England. 300 years for Ireland. And some of these persecutions can go very long. The Arian heresy lasted over 150 years. We don't know how long God is going to allow this to go on, but we've got to be set for the fight to the day we die. And this is why we've got to be anchored in the Catholic principles, anchored in the, the, the fight of all the saints, of all the popes, of all of Catholic tradition, which stands opposed to the destruction of the Catholic faith by Vatican II and the new Mass. Listen to these great, great words of Archbishop of Fev. <clears throat> I have had the occasion to say that I was waiting for signs from divine providence to carry out the acts that seemed to me necessary for the continuation of the Catholic Church. I must acknowledge now that I am convinced that these signs have come. What are the, those signs? There are two, in Assisi and the response that has been made to us from Rome to the objections that we have formulated with regard to religious liberty. And here he talks about the horrible, scandalous ecumenical gathering in Assisi when the Buddhists put a, uh, a Buddha on top of a Catholic altar and burnt incense to a Satan, to the devil, on a Catholic altar. The Hindus were there, the Muslims were there, the Jews were all in this church praying. And it was a terrible scandal to the whole world. Archbishop of Febvre raised up against this with Bishop de Castromere and shouted out, this is against God's first commandment, this is against Christ the King. And we don't hear the same reaction anymore from Bishop Fillet. When Pope Benedict XVI had the same season meeting, it was a little burp, a little blurp, a little chirp out of Bishop Fillet. That was it. Some priests spoke against it, but it was pretty much overlooked in silence. And even one society, St. Pius X priest, told me it is not a blasphemy. It's, it's just steps towards trying to win these souls. And even society priests, this, this is in 2011 or 10 this happened, and even they were starting to justify it. So, horrible thing. And then uh, Pope Benedict XVI, invited an atheist, it was a scandal. One society priest that year, that, that priest meeting in 2011, so it would have been the following February, he said Bishop Fillet came and uh, talked to all the priests in Post Falls, and you know, it, it, now we think it, really, it is the time to make the agreement with Rome. <coughs> Now's the time, to, this is 2011. So, and this priest is an old timer I was talking to. And I said, wait a minute, Father. What just happened last fall? In October. And it was the Assisi meeting with Pope Benedict XVI. And I said, don't you remember how Archbishop Lefeb condemned this? How this is a scandal? How it attacks the kingship of Christ and his divinity? And the priest said, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, this is not the time to make the agreement with Rome. <laughs> so, so even the priests, I don't know what it is, but it's a grace if we don't fall for it. Let's put it that way. It's a grace if we don't lose our faith in this day. So Archbishop Lefebvre talks about this horrible scandal of Assisi, and he says what's even worse was the defense of Assisi that Rome made. And he said they will not budge in their principles. And these same principles of modernism govern in Rome now. This is why we have to fight the same exact fight. Archbishop Lefebvre continues. This is why Providence has willed that by a certain joining of circumstances, we have drawn up a book that has just been appeared. The book they have uncrowned him. All of you men especially should read that. They have uncrowned him. They have uncrowned him. Who has uncrowned? And who has been uncrowned? Who has been uncrowned? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has uncrowned him? The Roman authorities of today. 
And this uncrowding was manifested in an obvious way at the time of the ceremony of Assisi. Jesus Christ is uncrowned. He is no longer the King, the universal King, the King whom we proclaim from the Feast of Christmas right up to His Ascension. All the religious feasts proclaim the royalty of our Lord Jesus Christ. All during the liturgical year we chant Rex Regum et Dominus Dominantium, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And behold, instead of magnifying the royalty of our Lord Jesus Christ, a pantheon of all religions is instituted. Just as the pagan emperors of Rome had made the pantheon of all the religions, today it is the Roman authorities of the Church who are doing it. And Pope Francis just continues the same trend. This is a tremendous scandal for souls, for Catholics, to see thus cast into doubt the universal kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is precisely that which is called liberalism. Liberalism is the institution of man's freedom in the place of God. As a consequence, the man who is in his conscience believes, hopes, professes any religion becomes as respectable as the one who says that he is professing the true religion. So all religions are put on a, level, a same level. The state, civil society, is no longer capable of knowing what is the true religion, they say. This is what has been stated to us in the document that we have received from Rome. The state, the civil state, is incompetent to religious matters and thus cannot decide which is the true or the false religion. By this fact itself, the state must let all religion, religious errors, whatever they are, spread out in this so-called autonomous social space, as they call it, which is in practice all the life of the state because man is free to have his own religion. We say no, no, and no. And if you hear the recording of Archbishop of saying this, he's mad. He's a bishop ready to swing that, that crowbar. He is mad because Christ is attacked. He continues, and the Holy Mass shows us this. There is a law, a law of love, that our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross claims. He proclaims and preaches to us. He says to us, you must obey the law of love. Whoever does not obey the law of love is not worthy of eternal life. It is then an obligatory law. We are not free to choose our own religion. There is only one, the one that our Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed from the height of the cross. Liberalism has become the idol of our modern times, an idol that is now adored in most of the countries of the world, even in the Catholic countries. It is this liberty of man in regard to God which defies God which wants to make its own religion of the rights of man. Think about this. All those ladies going to have abortions today. All those sodomites proclaiming their rights and waving their flags in our public streets and schools and stuffing this, this doctrine down the throats of all the children throughout the world, certainly the Western world. How are they doing it all? It's all done in the, right, in the name of the rights of man. Dear girl, why are you going to go kill your baby in, in this hospital? It's my right, she's going to say. I have my rights over my body. And it's in the name of the rights of man that Christ and all the commandments are being torn down. This is the point of Archbishop of In the name of the rights of man, man defies God. It's own, his own commandments, which its lay associations with the secular states with a secular education, without God, that is liberalism. How is it possible, he says, that the Roman authorities profess and encourage this liberalism in the Declaration of Vatican II on Religious Liberty? It is that which, in my view, is very serious. Rome is in darkness, in the darkness of error. It is impossible for us to deny it. How can we tolerate, from our point of view as Catholics, and so much the more from our viewpoint as priests, that, that spectacle that could be seen at Assisi. 
St. Peter's Church, which was given to the Buddhists to celebrate their pagan worship there. Was it conceivable to see them perform their pagan ceremony in front of the tabernacle of our Lord Jesus Christ? No doubt empty, but covered by their idol, by Buddha, and this in a Catholic church, a church of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are, they, there they are. The facts speak for themselves. It is impossible for us to conceive a more serious error. How could that actually be done? Let us leave the answer to the good Lord. It is he who manages all things. It is our Lord Jesus Christ who is the master of events. It is he who knows what will be the future of this hold of errors on Rome and the highest authorities. From the Pope and the Cardinals and passing through all the bishops of the world, for all the bishops of the world follow the false ideas of the Council on ecumenism and liberalism. God alone knows where that, that is going to lead. But for us, if we want to remain Catholic, and if we want to continue the Church, we have some indefeasible duties. We have serious obligations which oblige us, first of all, to multiply the priests who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, in His kingship, in His social kingship, according to the doctrine of the Church. So here's, he always comes back to this, the importance of seminaries. The importance of seminary. And that's why Father Pfeiffer started the seminary in Boston, Kentucky. We've been there now four years with the seminary going. It's been a rough ride with many bombs and missiles hitting at it. Uh, bishops trying to destroy it. Even the, the so-called one of the false resistance. He's come to blast it. They want it blasted off the face of the earth because they want the termination of the work of Archbishop of Fed and of the work of Catholic tradition. That's why it's so hated and attacked. And it's not so much us, but as much as what we stand for. And this is what the Archbishop of Fed, this is why a cone came under such fire from the enemies of Christ. So he always comes back to this, the importance of seminaries and priests. That is why I am happy that the book on liberalism has appeared, this is the, uh, they have uncrowned him, so that everyone can be nourished by it and understand well the struggle we are carrying on. So you got, especially you men, you've got to read and reread every year, go back to it, the they have uncrowned him, they have uncrowned him. It's, the Archbishop just shows the engine of the problem today. And he continues, This is not a human battle. We are in close combat with Satan. It is a struggle that demands all the supernatural forces which we need in order to fight against him who wants to destroy the Catholic Church radically, we wi he who wishes the destruction of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has wanted this ever since our Lord was born, and he wants to go on abolishing and destroying his mystical body wiping out his reign and all his institutions, whatever they may be. We have to be conscious of this dramatic, apocalyptic struggle in which we live and not minimize it. To the extent that we minimize it, our eagerness in the battle grows less. We become weaker and dare no more to proclaim the truth. This is exactly what's happened to the new Conciliar SSPX. They minimize the fight for the faith. Let's just get canonical recognition. And soon they, all their weapons go down. We no longer dare to proclaim the social kingship of our Lord because that sounds bad to the ears of the secular and atheistic world. To say that our Lord Jesus Christ should reign in society seems to be a folly to the world. We are taken for laggards, old-fashioned, frozen in the Middle Ages. All of that belongs to the past, they say. It is finished. That time has ended. It is no longer possible that our Lord Jesus Christ could reign in society. We could perhaps suffer a little of that tendency to be afraid of this public opinion that is against us, because we affirm that our, the, the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not be surprised, then, that the demonstrations that we can hold in favor of the social kingship of our Lord raised raise up in front of us an army 
directed by Satan in order to impede our influence from growing and even to destroy us. So if the Catholics of England, to keep the faith, were massacred, hanged, drawn, and quartered, were fined and imprisoned, we haven't even come to that yet. We can still have our school, we can still have our mission, we can still fly and take care of souls. So, see the Archbishop's point, the hatred of Satan against the work we are doing. This is why we are happy today to do these priestly ordinations. And here he announces he's going to consecrate four bishops. What will become of souls if no one anymore proclaims the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ? What will become of them if we do not give them the real grace which they need for their salvation? And he continues, There you have twenty... There you have 20 years that I have been going to Rome, writing, speaking, sending documents to say, follow tradition, come back to tradition, or else the church is going to her ruin. You, who have been placed in the succession of those who have built up the church, you must continue to build her up and not demolish her. They are deaf to our appeals. So Archbishop Lefebvre, he, does, he, he makes it very clear here, I'm not going to Rome to set up some canono canonical agreement. He, remember, he says it here, we must bring Rome back to Catholic tradition. And since Rome is stubborn in error, I will consecrate four bishops. So this is why he did this, and nothing has changed. It's, in fact, it's far worse, and the lines are more clearly drawn. And this is where we have to continue, dear, dear little flock, to raise Catholic families, large Catholic families, to do publications that defend the kingship of Christ and Catholic tradition, and the work of the rebuilding of the Catholic faith and the social reign of our Lord. We have to continue. And if it comes to blood, all right, don't be afraid. Our Lord said, I will give you the words to say. The Holy Ghost will give you the words to say and give you all the more the strength to endure imprisonment, torture, and even death. And how many saints were a bit afraid? And we read even, even in the history of the church, some saints fell away. They apostatized through fear. But later, they were sorrowful for their apostasy, came back, proclaimed the Catholic faith, and died martyrs. So don't be afraid. We have all the saints and all the popes who are in heaven cheering us on, and we must continue the fight and rebuilding. So let's pray to St. James, the great apostle, who himself was overwhelmed with discouragement. And it was Our Lady who came to him and said, No, stay, fight on. And in these days, Our Lady came to La Salette, and one of her words were, My little children of the light, you must fight. It's time for you to rise up and fight and defend my son. For this is the hour of hours, this is the time of times. And this is it. Well, let's hear her words. The same mother who encouraged St. Jane to fight on, proclaiming the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith of all time. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us to have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us to have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us to have recourse to the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.